floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the weekly TSC call. Uh, I'm sure everybody is aware of the antitrust policy, the notice of which is being displayed. As a reminder, we also have the code of conduct linked from the agenda that everybody needs to be aware of and be ready to live by. So um, we have a bit of a different meeting today because we have a guest. Uh, uh, so we have David, the chair of the media and entertainment SIG, uh, will give us a short presentation of what's going on in that group. And it's a bit of a call for help or you know interested parties to help them with their project but so before that uh let's uh, start with the usual announcements who wants the honor of talking about the newsletter i don't know if it's, there's much point but uh since jessica's back jessica with the developer newsletter so i think uh, everyone <laughs> kind of knows yeah. the routine here, but it goes out every Friday, Dev Weekly. Um, please just go in there if you have anything to add. You know, we're open to any sort of updates with the projects, um, any new features or events, uh, any good technical articles you've seen. Um, please help us fill that out. Uh, I think we've grown to over 1,200 folks on that list. So uh, people are reading it and appreciate the content. So if you can, please update it. Thank you, Jessica. Yep. So the other thing I wanted to highlight, I think everybody should be aware of, the TS election, TSC election is going on, and uh, with the nomination period ends tomorrow at the end of uh, the day Pacific time. Tracy has her hand up. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't realize, but it looks like the last time I got a Dev Weekly newsletter was in June. Um, and so oh. I guess I'm asking if it's still going out weekly or we purposely took you off the list, Tracy. What's that? Yeah, we well, purposely maybe. took you off the list. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's still going out. That's strange. Um, okay, I'll check my uh, spam filters and see what's happening with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just ping me if 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 you know you're you're still signed up to it and everything. We'll we'll figure out what's going on. But it, it it's still going out every Friday um, afternoon okay. Eastern time. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then so to, to again back to the election. So the election is ongoing. I think all the TSC members, except for a couple, namely Mark and Gary, are running again. And um, and we have a whole bunch of new candidates. So I look forward to uh, to this. But so beware if you know of anybody else you want to nominate. Tomorrow is the last chance. And um, so let's, uh, is there any other announcements from anybody else? No, okay. So I, uh, so I do hope that the uh, election is going better and that the use of the tool is working out. Um, <laughs> I, from what I saw on the mailing list, it seems to be going pretty smoothly. There hasn't been too many people complaining that they are not in the, you know, uh, that the system is not reporting them as eligible when they think they are. They are. So hopefully uh, it will be easier on the staff this year. Sorry, right. so let's get back to the agenda. Quarterly reports. So we have a couple of, uh, older ones, so to speak. So cello, that there was something we already had uh, last time. Uh, there is nothing new. It's, you know, I, just before the call, I went back to it. Seems like there is no issue that needs to be raised, but this is your chance to raise any other issues you might want to bring up. And uh, otherwise we did receive the borough project report and uh, I mean, they are saying there isn't much happening. It has been a bit slow, mostly due to summer, but uh, they are still making progress in uh, publishing releases. And then just before the call, basically we received the URSA report. So as I was saying, HOT is not on the call. 
is traveling, but it did manage to get the report out. I saw several of us managed to actually review it, but I will put it again on the agenda for next week if anybody else has uh, anything else they want to bring up. But if there's an issue you want to bring up now, obviously it'll be easier when hot is here, but uh, let me know. Arun. Hey, thanks, Arnold. So I did not, I do not have an issue. Rather, I just wanted to hear somebody uh, from somebody on Baro from somebody within the community, right? So uh, the, what I was interested in particular is, you know, uh, Baro has been in, in leading front, leading the front in terms of reusability within Hyperledger uh, with Fabric and so to both supporting at least the EVM part of it to be used within it. So I wanted to know if that interaction is going still or if there are requirements coming in from different projects of how did it help or why? I mean, is it helping or not helping? So maybe there are some learnings um, that Burrow can share with others. So I don't know how much activity there's still around this. I can speak for Fabric. I mean, we did have an effort around what's referred to as the chain code uh, EVM, where we basically embedded the borrow EVM into the fa into fabric so that you could run a solid smart contract on a fabric uh, network. And we have also a client uh, gateway that allows to run web three AP uh, clients against the fabric network. However, this work has not gained a lot of momentum in terms of uh, community use. And so the people who are actually involved in this work have left IBM and I don't think anybody else really is working on this. So this piece, unfortunately, at this point is kind of dormant. And um, so I don't think there is any active communication anymore with Burrow on that front. And Dave may know something I don't know, but uh, I believe that's the status. No, it's been dead for a while. I don't, haven't heard of anybody using it. And you're right, yeah. the maintainers are not maintaining it anymore. All right, Tracy. Yeah, so I just, I wanna go back to maybe where Arun was trying to get to, which is how did, how did this all come about? How did it, it play together? So I remember in uh, one of the first Hackfest that I attended, I think it was in DC, um, where both folks from the borough community and folks from the Sawtooth community were at that Hackfest and decided that they wanted to see what it would take to, to bring the EVM to Sawtooth. And so they got in a room during that Hackfest and they, they started that process of, you know, um, the discussion around how to how to make that happen, and then uh, because they had had that opportunity to be face to face and uh, be in a room and work on the whiteboard uh, after they went back their separate ways, they were able to to better keep in touch and uh, make that happen. So Arun, I don't know if it was more about um, your question was more about how do we get people to work together, but that's how that one particularly came about. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks, um, Arnold and Dave. I, I guess all three answers kind of gave me what I wanted. I wanted from both perspectives, but yeah, this clarifies a bit. I, I know there are a few more projects who are looking for collaboration and they may be willing to learn how they could collaborate with the rest of the projects in the community, uh, specifically around, I guess one of the meeting that I attended was on um, uh, a presentation on Firefly and, and they run a weekly call, right? So I was interested in to see uh, when they proposed fabric connectors to Firefly, just to understand how that is built and what kind of collaboration is possible. Looks like there are components that could be reused across, not just within Firefly, but it could as well be just a, a component that can supplement fabric project, for example. And that's when I had this thought or the question. And yeah, sure, probably we should see if we can 
do something to improve the collaboration in terms so, of reusing components. Yeah, so this is an interesting uh, question indeed. But you know, I think the experience with Burrow, which you know, as we talked about, uh, that civil connections with other projects, to me, show that it's not like there is an inherent problem that people don't want to collaborate across projects, even though the TSC has been lamenting about the lack of cooperation, collaborations between the projects, you know, since forever. Uh, to me, this is really because, well, you know, it's not because people don't want to, is that when the experience that we just saw, we talked about with Burrow shows in fact that when there is a common interest, the, the, the collaboration can take place. There's nothing really stopping that from happening. And so maybe it's just the way it is that there isn't more need for collaboration. And I think, you know, if anybody feels like, hey, we're trying to work with another group, they are just ignoring us. I think then we should, you know, I welcome them to speak up and let us know because I, my, my impression is that, you know, this is not the problem. But uh, I'd be happy to hear otherwise if that's the case, because I, I definitely would want to address it if there was just like, you know, a lack of response from one project towards another or something, you know, not interest in uh, responding to any inquiries. Oh, I, I don't think so. I heard any such comment. So, yeah, right. we don't have such a problem. So it's a matter of, to me, it's really, it shows that it's a matter more of uh, finding something that, you know, will trigger interest from two groups to different projects to say, yeah, I have an interest in making this happen. Let's work together. And even the, the cases we talked about, you know, you could say these were projects that were competing with one another because it was between the different ledgers. There was still collaboration happening. Oh. All right, anything else? Uh, this is slightly sidetracked from the report, but it's okay. Thanks for raising the question, Ari. Okay, if there's nothing else in the reports, then I suggest we move to the main item for the agenda for today. As David, I will let you speak up and do a better job than I did uh, introducing your topic, but uh, you have the floor. Thanks very much. What I would like to do today is to introduce to you, I should probably just share my screen as well, if that's okay. Yeah, if you want to, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Can everybody see that? Yes. Fantastic. So, Yep, my name is David. I'm a professor at UCLA. Uh, I come to you from the world of the humanities. Um, I, I work in three departments at UCLA. One is my, my home department is comparative literature. So professionally speaking, my background is in Russian studies, which will be relevant in about two minutes. Uh, I'm also in musicology, which is relevant to this project. And I also teach in digital humanities. So I helped to put together the media and entertainment uh, special interest group because for me, from a selfish point of view, it seemed to me that Hyperledger could do a great deal of good work in those parts of the world where piracy is a problem. And so uh, the official interest was gathered and we registered and we now exist. So we need a project. And because I have a large data set um, for more than, well, more than 20 years, I've been collecting music from that part of the world. And I recently donated my entire collection, which is over 2 million audio files from across the 20th century. And these are all from Eastern Europe. I donated it to a museum in Los Angeles. So the project here that you can see on the screen, um, a distributed music curation platform, is really something that is designed to uh, protect copyright, um, to uh, hypothetically improve automatic payments for licensing those assets, 
and it's a tool that could be used by two groups of people well two types of institution one would be an artist or a label so the artist um, with good metadata adds their their asset their song their musical composition to a decentralized platform and then they license that or they uh, or the asset would be uploaded by a museum let's say the artist is no longer recording or it's an antique recording then a museum in the same way uploads it and licenses that um, the problem let me just scroll down it's a primarily textual presentation so i'll put the link in the chat it's not that interesting to look at until we get to the bottom and this is the the way that the um the metadata is being embedded in the file so this is a tool that i'm using together with the fraunhofer lab in germany these are the people who are responsible for the creation of the mp3 so you can see there's multiple ways of searching for an asset it's not just a matter of artist and title and publication so album or ep but it's also beats per minute it's the key <clears throat> excuse me it's an algorithmically calculated uh, guess at what the genre might be it's whether it's acoustic or electronic what the tempo is and what the emotion is and that emotion is here um, in the color column expressed as color so whatever the um, data set happens to be the the software determines that there is some meaningful collection between given files and expresses that connection as a color so there's something that connects yellow files for example that would allow somebody who doesn't understand the language maybe doesn't even know the alphabet to search through the files and find something similar to the track that they're already listening to so all of that's fairly straightforward and you can see here at the bottom what we're ideally looking for is a type of simple interface that would allow people um, I already have the front end designed and this, these are just some wireframes for what an app might look like but this is the problem we're facing which is does there exist a simple interface between not the database and the um, the knowledgeable admin, but between the, the the database and a typical user that would allow them to interact with Fabric in a way that does not presume any uh, pre-existing expertise. I've looked a lot, and obviously there are um, multiple companies, uh, blockchain as a service companies that do offer something like that. But this is the, the sort of the one of the two problems we're facing. One is the pure issue of hosting costs. And the other one is whether any of you guys might have seen across the other SIGs and attempt to get over what strikes us as the primary barrier when using fabric, which is its complexity. And I wonder, uh, I'll be as brief as I can. So I'll pause, if not stop there, and ask whether anybody has. No worries. It's okay, we have plenty of time, so don't oh, okay, okay. So is there anything in any of the other SIGs that has tried to, to grapple with this to reduce the complexity and increase the accessibility of Fabric for a, um, uh, I mean, for an ignorant user, for want of a, a less offensive word? So I don't, Angelo? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if uh, I understand complexity, how, what you mean exactly with complexity, but this was one of the goal of the Fabric Smart Client uh, to simplify, to reduce to the bare minimum uh, the complexity of dealing with, uh, with Fabric, which means that you don't even know, you don't even need to be aware that you are uh, um, facing a blockchain, that you are facing Fabric, you just are provided with the, um, something that is closer to the business uh, uh, to the business processes, and then uh, the, uh, the smart client will uh, will transform it to um, to fab to something that fabric understands. What about a user interface though? The actual the the client facing interface itself. 
that's up to you. I mean, that's uh, the client user interface. Um, if you're using a web UI or another type of UI, that's uh, it's not part of the smart client. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I mean, I've looked now for over six months and I check regularly, but it doesn't appear as if anybody is actually doing that. But what do you mean with the UI? Because uh, that would depend on your specific application, no? Yes, but if you can imagine that, let's say if we take the two use cases here, one is an artist and one is a museum, then that would be, you'd imagine the basic UI that somebody in the supply chain might also want, which is track and trace. Let's say upload track and trace. So it would be the same interface, crudely speaking, that somebody in any supply chain would want to um, uh, generate and employ. So you are looking for something that is already a pre-packaged um, auto shell? Uh, well, at least in its fundamental architecture, yeah. And I would, I would, it would seem logical that one of the SIGs might have encountered a related problem. Okay, so this is something different. Yeah. Arun has his hand up. Hey, um, thanks. I, I would like to understand the problem in more detail. Sorry for that. Um, so what you're looking for is a UI that has certain features pre-built into it. And then you're okay to spend some time on, let's say the fabric client part of it, right? So when you say the complexities, I, and I am assuming that you're talking with respect to sending transactions to blockchain. Is that the complexity that you're bringing up here? Yes, exactly. I mean, obviously, Fabric itself, the way that it is, is presented, is obviously assuming a reasonable level of expertise when it comes to, let's say, you know, CLI. And ideally, if, if Fabric is going to be used by the largest number of people possible, the majority of people know nothing about the blockchain and maybe don't even need to. But if there was a simple interface that would say, this is how you upload an asset, and we in the back end are getting and guaranteeing a certain degree of security using software that you don't need to understand. This simple interface will allow you to uh, upload the asset, um, let's say uh, improve the metadata, uh, add the licensing information if for some reason it wasn't included in the file already, and then loan it or lend it or license it. In other words, you know, like a supply chain, pass it into somebody else's hands and track the use or at least the safe delivery of that asset to somebody else. And sure, so talking about, sorry, we want one more thing. So then if you're talking about licensing something, it's not exactly the same as a supply chain because at some point you take the same asset back again. Sure, I, I see what you're asking for. So I initially got confused it with the operations part of it. If it was operations that you're looking into, I guess there is a new project in Hyperledger Labs that will ease up some of these things. It's called Fabric Operations Console. And that's in Hyperledger Labs right now. Mm -hmm. And um, there are projects that will help you also in terms of setting up your own network quickly if you want for, let's say, a quick POC kind of thing, right? So, I mean, starting with a script-based Fabric Samples repository and all the way till using a tool, something like Minifab or maybe using a, a blockchain automation framework kind of project which are there in Hyperledger Labs. They exactly, can help yeah, yeah. Out. yeah, so Minifab yeah. I know, which is fantastic. Yeah, Minifab though, you're still within the, the universe of, of terminal work. So, um, but I must admit Minifab is a, is a great step towards making um, the software uh, uh, accessible for many, many more people. Sure, so, and, and yeah, th these are the projects that will help you out in, in managing your network or setting up your network in short, span of time mm -hmm. and in addition to that if you're looking for a ui um so there there should be an example application that is available on fabric that can be reused um, however um, specifically on supply chain i guess then there is a ui part solely written within grid if that sounds but i'm not sure how much of it can be reused for fabric mm -hmm. I remember ultimately, you know, when Fabric first appeared within the promotional materials, in fact, this is, this is a text that I still encounter online. There was the, uh, the tendency to advertise Fabric as a tool that could be used, I forget the exact phrase, but it was something like, even for music delivery, 
And that was part of the dot blockchain project, which as we know, you know, no longer exists. And then it became Verify Media and you know, split into two or three different parts. But since that initial project, which was a big part of early fabric, I haven't seen anything similar. All right. So before Tracy, the, uh, Raya's is invisible hand up, but because I have superpower, I can see his hand up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, right. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I, I wanted, I, I think what I hear is, you know, uh, not just a call for pointers, but a, a call for help, a, a call for hands. And uh, I, I think that there is, you know, David has a need for, for, for implementers to, to help out. And uh, for those implementers, uh, I, I want to point out that uh, CNCF has a lab where they have in the past uh, said that they would be happy to host uh, test networks for us. Mm -hmm. So there is no need to worry about figuring out hosting or anything like that. So if there are implementers who could work with David um, and, and help him make some advance on this, because I know that David has been asking for, for assistance on this for a while, and uh, I, I really, I want this project to go. And the, it seems like all of the pieces are there, uh, but that's, that's it. I just wanted to make my pitch. Um, no, Tracy, that's me, right. Thank me, you, to give, Ryan. To give you an example, I mean, being in LA, I mean, I'm, I live very close to the Getty Museum. Um, you know, so this is one of the wealthiest museums in the world. And, the newer Getty Museum, because there are two, um, prides itself in particular on its photographic collections. And so what it does, it makes a reasonable amount of money lending out to other museums, massive high resolution um, uh, um, photographic files, which can then be used to make, you know, the resolution is so high that they, they in and of themselves can be used to exhibit in other countries around the country. So you can lend valuable assets without actually so saying saying goodbye to the original physical the thing is that they asked me up there to give a presentation and i gave it on fabric but they're very nervous about the fact that they said well there's no easy tool that we have in order to streamline our operations that would make it easy for any archivist to upload something that is a huge and be very very valuable to us into a secure decentralized system so it's the same thing i mean you know beyond music i mean this would make equally good sense for ebooks or for films or anything that is a digitized entertainment asset that is often stolen. So Tracy, your hand is no longer up? No, I, it's no longer up. I think it's uh, <laughs> maybe not as relevant anymore given what Rai just said. Um, I will tell you what I was going to say, which is uh to was to build on to Arun's comment that within blockchain automation framework there's also a supply chain sample application that uh i guess now based on what rai said anybody who might want to volunteer um could have a look at and see how that works to to uh, implement something that might be a ui for this but uh i it sounds to me more like they the, the need here is for people who can, one, deploy and operate a fabric network, and then two, provide some sort of user interface that would make this a um, something that could be used by people who don't know anything about the underlying data store. Yep, exactly. If you, and th for those of you who've very kindly spoken up, if you could just throw a, throw a link or two in the chat, that would be enormously helpful. Yeah, and to give a bit more context, I mean, this is how this whole thing came about. This is why David is here today, because essentially, you know, the um, it was brought up to my attention that David was looking for help. And, you know, I figured, well, we have already extended invitations to all the SIGs and working groups to come and present on what's going on in their, in their, uh, in their groups. Mm -hmm. And so I thought this was a good opportunity to hear from this SIG in particular. And I, I also wanted to follow up with answering your question, David, saying, you know, are, are there any other SIGs that have gone through this? Yep. Unfortunately, I can't say that they are. And mm -hmm. part of it is I'm not saying they are, they are not or they haven't. 
it's because we know very little about what's going on in the six, unfortunately. Hmm. We have, uh, as I said, extended invitation for the six to come and present. Very few of them have actually taken up the opportunity to come and talk about what's going on in their six. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Mark uh, Wagner likes to say, uh, the six are a bit like the relative from, you know, who live on the other side of town that you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And this is an unfortunate uh, state of affair, but unfortunately, it's still very true, I'm afraid. And so I think maybe the staff has more insights as to what's going on in all the six, and you know, we'd be in better position to, to say whether there are any other six that can, you know, that you can relate to that would have similar challenges. Maybe then the easiest thing, I see the chat's not working, but the, maybe the easiest thing, if you don't mind, would be purely for me to send you that URL I just showed you again. And then the, 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 wise, so, the, wise, the wise members of this group could take a closer look and just let me know, um, just point me in the right direction or at least point yeah. me in the direction of something that's worth investigating. So on that front, I want to highlight, the, the, there's a link from the agenda to your document that you actually oh, that's quickly true. work yeah. us through. Yeah. So people have that link. And you're right, the, I guess the chat in the Zoom call don't, right. doesn't work because so, they use. Right, so I always disable the chat uh, in Zoom because you know we're not supposed to use that. We use the Hyperledger, Hyperledger TSC channel in Element instead. Okay. So you, you're welcome to join that channel. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, engage no. further. Yes. Sorry, I, I don't have the ability to raise my hand apparently today. It's not showing. Oh, up with I'm sorry. I think Go Greg ahead. disabled it on me, but um, smart move, right? Um, would it make sense to write something up brief uh, for like the developer newsletter that would hit a wider range of people? Sort of saying, you know, is there any type of generic UI or something like that. Um, exactly. But if you don't mind, if that's not a hassle, I'd, then I'd be happy to do that. I mean, yeah, just... Mark, this is, Mark, this is another David. Uh, I've been supporting David and that is, yeah, one of the things. Um, yeah, actually I was gonna write up something and send it to uh, the developer newsletter this weekend. And I've been helping David share what's going on in the media SIG kind of in, yep. in other channels. But to our nose point, I mean, I, I do think we have a situation where kind of we currently have SIG somewhat separate from the technical part of the community. So when, you know, David does do something within the media SIG, I don't think it's re necessarily reaching the people who could help answer some of these technical problems or help implement. So, you know, I, I do think maybe this could be an interesting test to how do we bring the SIGs and the technical community closer together that could benefit, you know, the entire community as a whole, you know, it could help unblock the SIGs, it could help the projects, you know, with requirements, for example, or with, you know, you know, bugs or any, all sorts of things, you know, is there a win-win situation here for both the SIGs and the, you know, technical project community if we do bring these, you know, groups closer together? Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, aside from all of this, I've also um, advised David to send an email to the fabric mailing list and uh, made him aware of the contributors calls we have, you know, uh, on a regular basis. All of these are possible venues where you could, you know, try to reach out to the broader fabric community to try to get some help. Bobby has been waiting with their hand up. Hi, um, I just wanted to uh, mention to David that I did drop those links into the chat. And if you want to advertise something, please join us on Monday for the Learning Materials Working Group call, because that's a great place to store your information where people go to look for it. Um, but I just wanted to speak to the issue about the SIGs and the working groups and the technical community. Um, the project, the mentorship project that uh, Hyperledger is sponsoring, we're working with, we were talking with the Sawtooth people, we're working with the Firefly people. and. We have presentations in the social impact SIG and the trade finance SIG at the end of the project time. So the special interest groups have been more than accommodating for this mentorship project to let us have space to show off what we've been doing with Firefly. So 
that's one way just to join their meetings like we did and, and stick our noses in. All right, thank you, Bobby. All right, if there's nothing else, I think that's it for this uh, item. David, thank you. Uh, I hope, you know, this helps and, uh, you know, get the word out and eventually get some something going on. That'd be fantastic. And hopefully people can reach out to me. Um, I don't know if my email is in the, is at that URL you have. If it's not, I'll add it right now. Um, but I'm easy to find. Um, I'm the only person with my name at UCLA. <laughs> I'm, I'm also assuming this could be used with NFTs. Yes, that's exactly the idea. Yep, exactly yeah, with so. NFTs, because that obviously when it comes to copyright protection, that's a very promising technology as well. And maybe being more, you know, mention that specifically might generate more interest than a newsletter or something. Sure. I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, considering, you know, the, the, the biggest splash in the NFT world obviously came in the world of fine arts. It didn't come in music at all. So that's a pretty sexy story when um, somebody sells an NFT that is automatically um, catapulted into one of the most expensive paintings ever sold. Yeah. And sex always sells on the internet, right? Uh, apparently, so I'm told, yeah. <laughs> and we do... Hyperledger, uh, Hyperledger proper has a project that we're working on uh, with uh, HBCUs around some NFT uh, training. So uh, there may be some opportunity later this year uh, to integrate some of that as well. So uh, th there are a lot of pieces to connect. Um, I don't know if uh, David Boswell want to follow up on that. I'm kind of losing my voice. Yeah, that's a good point, Ryan. I mean, I do think it's helpful for us to provide more resources for people like David who are trying to build these things. And, and we are, we have actually looped David into the planning for the workshop, uh, the, the fabric workshop. So it'd be good to get his input about like what would be a helpful resource to create and what would, you know, unblock him. So yeah, David, any, any input into that, you know, what sort of additional resources we could provide would certainly be welcome. All right. So I think that closes it. Thank you again, David. And uh, thank you very talk. much. That was that was very kind of you to, to have. Uh, no problem. I and mean, happy to help if we can. So I mean, you feel free to drop off now or stick around if you want to have some insight as to what we are doing in this group, although we don't have the most exciting agenda for today, other than what we already covered. Um, so let's get to this. Uh, let me first ask the other TSC members if there is any topic in particular they would like to discuss now. Okay, if not, then I thought we should have yet another look at the backlog and see where thing, uh, things stand because I have the feeling that, you know, some of these items could be basically closed slash, slash abandoned. <laughs> or, you know, I don't know how to call it, but I have the feeling we have some long standing item there that probably that may not never get a proper resolution anyway. So I know Arun, I'm gonna put you on the spot because you actually sent an email the other day saying, yeah, when there was last week when I canceled the call saying, I don't think we have anything to discuss. There were a couple of items, the long-term agenda in particular. Uh, I remember last time we did a cleanup, I was ready to close it. I think everybody was really on board for this. And you say, well, don't close it quite yet. I'm going to follow up on this. Oh, not. Uh, sure. So, not this topic and uh, the, the the other one. What if top level? What if a top level project changes? It's... Okay. So, at this point, I mean, you know, when when Dan Middleton opened this, you see how long it's been. Uh, well, you don't see it there because it's been modified by Gary recently. But you know, even then, it's been a while. 
Um, this agenda is several years old, like three years or so. And I don't think, you know, it's, uh, it actually helped us at the time because it helped us, uh, you know, generate some kind of interesting discussions. But I think there is nothing more that we can do and nothing actionable that will come out of this anymore. So on that basis, I'm proposing to close this. Does, it, does this have a second? I second. I second. All right. Thank you. So anyone in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposing speak up, say, say so now. Anyone wants to be listed as abstaining? Okay, hearing nobody, I think this is approved. Thank you. So I can give a quick update on the DCO and the pseudonyms because this was, I mean, I don't have an answer, unfortunately, but Brian told me that this is not forgotten. It's a real issue. And this is, you know, something that they're still discussing and looking into. I did point out that in our case, and by the way, I should mention that there is a sister project to Hyperledger called the Open SSF, it's the Open Source Security Foundation, which is looking into securing open source in general. And uh, there is a project within that group, or there's a working group within a project. I don't know which way I should say it, but uh, I mean, I have the terminology quite right, but there is an effort looking into this kind of problems. And uh, they don't have an answer, unfortunately. If they had one, I would have been happy to report, hey, the solution has been found for us. But this is something they actually are looking into. It's, I, I looked into it the other day and they had uh, very similar use cases. It's not the only ones, but this, this you know, need for anonymity is actually recognized as a general problem. And so what I'm trying to say essentially is there may be hope you know, that the solution will be coming from elsewhere and then we'll just be able to adopt it. But that still means for us right now, I do think we should keep it open because this is worth uh, uh, addressing for real. And whether we address it ourselves or it, the solution comes from elsewhere, I think this is something we want to keep on our, on our agenda. Dano, go ahead. So can we go back into the DCO and student page? So the six and the seventh options um, at the end, the last two, I think are the two, if we have to work independently, I'm um, go up to the bullet list, some possibilities. The last two, I think are the two, if we need to act without them providing guidance, are I think the ones we should go for. Um, both of them would have a real signed off by person in the list as a requirement. And we would support other people. The question is whether the person signing off knows the real identity of the other people um, on the sign off list or whether we just let it in and we go by the, the latter clauses of the DCO to say, to my knowledge, it passes the standards and I'm signing off on it. So I think those, if, if we don't get clarity from, from that other group, the security group, and we need to get a policy. And I, I think we need to get a policy at some point, sooner rather than later, rather than letting this drag on, even if we change it later when we get their suggestion. But those are the two that I think we should consider between those. I think anything from, um, of the first five, I don't think will give us the protection we need. All right, thank you. Any reactions, thoughts? Tracy, go ahead. Uh, the only thought I have to that is the hit by a bus 
uh, example where it's the person who knew the pseudonym is hit by a bus, uh, then we still don't know like who that person was, right? If we have to go back and, and do any sort of uh, digging into that particular request or pull request. So that, yeah, um, that is how, so, so when you, I guess it means what, what, what sort of liability we're taking on when we do a signed off by for someone who we don't know. Um, and my thought is if you're doing a signed off by, what if the person you know gets hit by a bus and can't be held accountable? You know, it's the same situation as if you sign off without, with fully known signature and you're the only sign off by on a questionable PR and you're hit by a bus um, and they can't get a hold of you. So I think when you do do a sign off by for someone whose identity you know, you're accepting some of the liability or something you don't know. So I think that's some of the discussion we need to have. And I don't think we should expect maintainers, um, require maintainers actually, to do sign off by people who are not willing to unmask publicly. Um, so that's you know one twist to it is that by doing a signed off by you're accepting some of the liability if such liability exists or at least some of the uh, answerability for, for that situation. Um, yeah, and if, if they can't find you and they can't get to the real person, that's just a variation of the if one person signed off by and they can't find that person. But you know, at the same time, we can't require maintainers to sign off on anonymous and semi-anonymous people because of that liability. I think um, as well, uh, I mean, let's just, let's forget the DCO part of this. Uh, I, I see this as like, if someone, if someone snuck in code of unknown provenance, uh, there would be a re-implementation effort, right? So if we ended up in a situation where, you know, one side or the other of this transaction or both, I mean, if, if someone, if someone just died, you know, how would you resolve their licensing issues? Uh, if you couldn't, you would need to re-implement it. So it's not like there's no solution to this problem. It's not the best solution, but I, it's not I, I think the problem is slightly different because it's a, it's a, a commitment issue, right? Uh, when you sign off, you commit that, you know, any IP you have, you're making it available freely for the project to use. And if somebody then comes and starts suing people, you need to be able to identify that person as being the person who actually made the commitment and therefore their claims are, you know, irrelevant. And if the person who could make the connection has been hit by a bus to follow uh, Tracy's example, then you can never prove that. You've lost the only link you had. I agree that the, the solution might still remain that, well, you have to rewrite your code, but uh, it's a bit of a different take on it. Troy has his hand up. Sure, yeah. I, I, my personal opinion is when we start saying liability, I don't think maintainers should be doing this. Um, my second point is, if we were going to have this, it should actually be Linux Foundation who's registering people um, and maintaining that list, not maintainers. So you mean that the the Linux Foundation would know who the the anonymous person is, and the Linux Foundation would be attesting on their behalf that they are known? Is that what I understand? Yeah, or Hyperledger Foundation, whichever organization we're talking about. I, I think it should be the foundations making these policies and making the tools and making the registrations. I don't understand how maintainers are going to do this um, with all of the discussion that we've had. And I particularly don't like, um, you know, the thoughts about liability. It just doesn't ring uh, uh, right to me. Gotcha. Thanks. for uh, <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying that. All right, so I actually didn't mean to dive into this topic, although clearly it's still of interest to a lot of people. I, it's pretty obvious that there is no easy solution, but anyway, back to the cleaning exercise, I meant to say, I think this is still something we want to keep there, whether we can make progress or not. It's not something we can just, you know, sweep under the rug kind of thing. So let's go back, can we go back to the backlog? Um, 
was there and eat low-hanging fruit. Yeah, the restructured greenhouse, uh, we don't have to worry about this. Uh, the task force uh, was in charge of the, was in charge of this. Um, is just completed it has just completed its activity, and so there is actually already. If you go to the website, the website has been updated, and maybe at this point we can just close it as completed. Is there any reason we can't? Arun, I know you had still some action item for on the last call we had last week, I believe, but this is like minor detail implementation. So for those who haven't looked at it, you know, I invite you all to go back to the website, hyperledger.org. And I know a lot of us don't get there very often, but uh, you will see that the greenhouse is no longer there. Instead, we are using uh, a tool that has been you know, that is being more and more widely used across Linux Foundation and that allows to display, you know, information in different ways. And so this is, you know, the website has been revamped. And it actually gives, so if people have comments, this is something that can still be fine-tuned, but, you know, for the most part, uh, the key thing is that the greenhouse uh, click on is no use. longer there. Hmm? Uh, I don't know who's sharing the screen. Click on use, yeah. Use. It's right, right? Yes. The stem of cards and you can have different attributes being displayed and you can click on them and get more information and there are different possible views. And so it's pretty cool. And uh, I think it provides a lot more information than we had before. As a reminder, before when we had this big graphic with the greenhouse with categories, you could not actually click on anything on that map because it, for technical reasons, it was not practical to maintain links everywhere. So now this is the tool that's being used across uh, LF. And so we are up to speed with this using landscape. So again, if people have comments, you're welcome to engage. And, and there is a repository that holds all this information. And uh, Arun has been active in helping out to implement the details behind this. And he deserves credit for that. And uh, if you have comments to, again, feel free to provide them. But so as far as the backlog is concerned, again, I think we can close this as done. Arun, am I missing anything? Would, would that even need a vote? No, I don't think so. It's like we, you know, we agreed we needed to do this. The task force was created. It has completed its job. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm, some of the opinion just mark it as completed. That's it. I don't think we need a vote. This is like, I don't think we need to vote on facts. <laughs> Although, you know, there are alternate facts for some people, but. Gonna say nowadays we might. <laughs> no, I do not want to endorse that point of view. <laughs> Sorry. All right. I guess credit also goes to Tracy for, uh, for this thing that she started initially. And, and not, I just wanted to um, ask you if you want to bring out the topic that, that the outcome of the last meeting was that if more task forces are required, um, specifically for the topics that we had, it will be brought up, right? So that that is still, and there, there is still possibility that the future work on this could get extended back with additional task force. Yes, that's a good point. I mean, we had quite a few discussions. Some of them were not directly related to this particular effort, kind of, you know, they, they were like side tracking kind of topics. And we agreed not to drag on this task force, try to tackle these questions within the existing task force, but instead 
to close it, call, you know, call it a day for now and say, hey, any of those topics, if we want to follow them on, we can create new task groups so that it's clearly acknowledged that it's a different topic and then people you know, who have not participated in this particular task force get a chance to participate as well if they're interested. Let's close the label you need to put. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we're out of time, but I'm glad we killed a few of those. We'll continue. And uh, for now, I just want to thank you all for joining and uh, have a good week. We'll talk again next week. Goodbye. See ya.